and welcome to Quark Talk. I'm Crystal here Tuesday morning. Gosh, there are so many important, sensitive social issues about women that I want to cover that we never have time to cover. Today we're having one that we kind of like have an umbrella of some amazing group that supports all these underprivileged women in Hawaii who are, you know, for whatever reason it is, they just happen to get the short end of the stick, and how do you get back on your feet after you've been, whether you've been incarcerated, you've been homeless, you, you have juvenile issues, oh God, there's so many things. But you know, in this short time, we're gonna hone in on some issues. We're gonna go straight into it. Uh, let me introduce our wonderful guest today. On behalf of the Women's Fund of Hawaii, uh, we have PhD, wow, incarcerated women's topic, but Leela Bilmes, is it? Yep, that's Goldstein. exactly right. Thank Welcome you. so much. Thank you so much, Crystal. Glad to be here. And a privilege for us to hear what you have to say on behalf of the Women's Fund that covers all these women's issues. So let's go a little bit backwards um, and give us a small kind of a history of how the Women's Fund was started and what you focus on first. Okay, great. Well, we are a 12-year-old nonprofit, and prior to receiving our 501c3 um, status, we were incubated at Hawaii Community Foundation. Mm -hmm. What distinguishes us is that we're community-based, which means we bring together donors, activists, community leaders to identify problems for women and girls in Hawaii and to solve them together. We invest um, in our community through $5,000 grants. That's the maximum amount for each grant. And last year we gave $100,000 um, to programs for women and girls. So that was a milestone for us and we were thrilled to, to be able to do that. We invest in programs, again, for women and girls, and the organizations are predominantly led by women. Excellent. So I don't mm -hmm. want to rain on your parade because it sounds wonderful, but 5,000 a grant, how much can that possibly cover that will make an, an, you know, affect that particular problem or issue? Yeah, well, um, you know, you'd be surprised. Some yeah, okay. In several cases, for several of the nonprofits, they were we were we seeded programs. So a couple of the organizations for which that's true is Surf Rider Spirit Sessions. Yes, I'm aware of that. Um, yeah, that's a great one. Yes, you know, working with uh, Girls Court, mm -hmm. um, and they were just uh, launching that program, and so the five thousand made a difference. I, I'm pretty sure we weren't their only funding, but mm, right. it. it helped. Another program uh, that was launched with our help was the behavioral, excuse me, behavioral mm -hmm. um, therapist at Waikiki Health. So Waikiki Health is a big organization yes. and they do a lot of terrific work for the entire community. Mm -hmm. um, but this particular uh, therapist was to work or is still working with uh, the women who are pregnant and dealing with substance abuse issues. Yeah. Okay. And that program started as a result of our $5,000 investment. So um, I can tell a great impact story about that too, of a woman uh, who is so proud of her progress. Her name is Christina, and her real name according to her wishes. She arrived at uh, Women's Way mm -hmm. and started working with the uh, clinic, mm -hmm. Waikiki Health. She was three months pregnant, had been battling substance abuse for 20 how, years. How old is she? Do you mind? Uh, you know, I'm not sure how old she okay. is. I think she's in her, she now is in her 30s. Okay. She arrived um, in shackles in a green okay. prison jumpsuit because oh. she was arrested for auto theft and she was three months pregnant. And she worked with the behavioral therapist and the other service providers at Waikiki Health, gave birth to a healthy baby girl. She's reunited with family and last I heard, she had moved to the mainland. She was getting her degree so that she could help uh -huh. women who are in the position she was in to get better too. So Wonderful. that's a great story. Absolutely. Of success. And yeah. we'll start with that success. Do you think that women who have gone through so much, so much life changing um, issues, that they feel the need to give back, to help others, to get themselves back on their feet? Is that some way of almost a therapeutic process for themselves? I do think so. Yeah. I think that's generally true of women, but also but our tagline for our organization is when women thrive, communities prosper, and oh, it's exactly it. that instinct yeah. that um, I believe makes that statement true. Mm. So when, when women do well, they, re, they invest in their families. A woman will spend 90% of her income on her family. But that also involves spending in the community. So the family gets stronger, our community gets stronger, our society gets stronger. Yeah. 
So. And, and I'm glad you mentioned income because I feel like women, as opposed to men, let's just say for incarcerated women, for example, mm -hmm. um, people don't really think about all the aspects that are uh, consequential in them being away from family. Uh, you know, if they have family, if they have children, if they have other things that, or people that they need to take care of, and what, how that affects everybody else. You know, when guys are behind bars, they just think, okay, so we'll take care of things while you're in there. But mm -hmm. when women are away, it just destroys a lot. Yeah, you're them. absolutely right. And we have a couple of grants that we've done to um, help women as there, there are a couple that work with women while they're in prison to maintain a connection mm -hmm. with their children. For example, Read to Me International is one of our oh. grantees and they worked with writing and also illustrating so that the moms could do books for their kids and, and maintain that connection. And there are other programs at WCCC that um, help women with substance abuse parenting. There's a program that we funded through Parents, Inc. So these are programs that are working with the uh, jails in Hawaii? They're or the programs mostly WCCC, as it turns out. Okay. Um, yeah, so they're working with the women who are incarcerated. Right, yeah. right. Can we talk a little bit about the life of incarcerated women? I mean, I know that's not something that you do deal with directly, but just an example, like going back to Christina's story, her backstory, when she was, you know, incarcerated, the life there and the well-being and the lack of the support and how that affected her emotionally, psychologically, physically, because I hear there are a lot of chronic illnesses that come from women being in behind bars more more than men. What are some implications as a woman behind bars, do you think? Well, honestly, the first thing that jumps to mind is that the sexual abuse that occurs for, for women behind bars. Wow. And there was a big case, I think, recently in Kentucky involving Hawaii inmates because we send a large number of our uh, incarcerated men and women, I believe, to the mainland. Mm. Mm. That's, that's a very sensitive issue, and people don't want to talk about it because there's so much shame and, and, and so much humiliation mm -hmm. and sensitivity with that. Yeah. So, but what can people do? I mean, maybe acknowledging the fact that these things do happen to have programs after they come out to support that. Is that what people do? Um, I think probably so. Here in Hawaii, 25% of the women who come out of prison go to Y and I. Yeah, um, why is that? Is that just a community that supports incarcerated women? Um, I don't know if it's that necessarily. I think maybe many from women there? are from there. Okay. And we as a community uh, could work toward providing more resources yeah. to help with um, transition. Mm -hmm. Um, and also rehabilitation or uh, especially as regards I think substance abuse I think half of the women who go back mm. in or, or half of the women excuse me half of the women who go back it's not because of a new crime but it's because of a drug relapse yeah no it's a vicious cycle yeah. and you know I read somewhere in your report that the there's an over representation of native Hawaiian women particularly yeah. Uh, behind yeah. bars. Why do you think that is? Is that some kind of, again, it's the community and the environment? Yeah, um, I think that, the, you know, hopelessness and poverty mm -hmm. um, exacerbate criminalization. Yeah. Um, and do you think women tend to be affected by hopelessness and poverty more so than men, or, or are they affected in a different way? I don't think they're effect, affected more than men. I think okay. men are incarcerated at a higher rate than women. Hmm. I believe that. I, I believe the statistics will bear that out. Um, but we still have a problem. The, in, the rates of incarceration for both genders have gone up, but the crime rate has gone down. Right. I don't understand yeah. that. Are they just trying to put more people behind bars because they think that can contain? I think it's, I believe it's because of policy. Um, <laughs> there's uh, the drug policies, the war on drugs. Um, there's the truth in sentencing, which means that uh, inmates must serve their mm. terms rather than being let out for good behavior. I think there's new, there are new um, sort of uh, guidelines for, for the good behavior and yeah, also yeah. more conservative parole boards. Do you think Hawaii tends to be on the conservative side or the more radical side in terms of incarceration for women particularly? How do you place that in the war, in the U.S. in the American statistics? I've read that we're more aggressive. Okay. Yeah. I don't have a personal opinion on that, but that that's what I read. 
Huh. Um, I, I, and the reason why I don't have an opinion is because I don't, I haven't done enough research myself yeah. to go out on that limb. But okay. I read somewhere recently there was an article, or maybe it was a news article, um, about women behind bars and the lack of even the basic fundamental support, like feminine hygiene, in in, a, in an average prison. They don't think it's always the men who manage the prison, so they don't think about oh, sanitary napkins. We don't have those. So there was a case where a woman asked for it, and they're like they had to get the emergency unit to get some like thick band-aids from the emergency clinic. They don't even have pads. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. The lack of support, the lack of, you know, just the overall well-being for a woman, wherever she is. Yeah, it's, um, it kind of strips away a person's dignity. Yes. Right? And it yeah. just goes to show how, how little we really focus on some fundamental things that women need to, to, to survive and, and just to, well-being is so important. So going back to the Women's Fund is this well-being. How do you support that and how, how are ways, how do you feel is the most effective way to support that for people who have been in such trying situations? Well, hopefully um, some of the programs that we've supported help to ease the transition yeah. uh, back into the community. Mm -hmm. And we do provide through our grantees some, uh, we hope, positive experiences while the, the, the women are serving their terms. So there's an example of one that I love, um, Ahahui Malama Ikalokahi. And they do uh, uh, restoration and education out at Kavai Nui uh, swamp out in oh, Kailua. Okay. So I actually joined uh, a crew of 10 women when we went to do this wetland uh, restoration and the leader there just gave us a great education about the native plants that were there and which hmm. were the invasive ones and there's this boulder and he explained to us why it was carved out and it was just, it was very interesting. And there is something cathartic about working on the land, which is what we then did, which was, you know, with weed whackers and pulling weeds. And it, get, it was a great opportunity for me to uh, get to know some of the women and, and, and connect um, with them and hear about what they thought of the program. And one woman said to me, you go in ugly and you come out beautiful. Oh wow! Yeah, and that is beautiful. Yeah, it is. And another another woman wrote me a letter and you know to thank us for for supporting the program. Yeah. And she drew a metaphor in her letter of um, how she felt that the whole process was like what she's doing, which is pulling out the roots and pulling out the stuff that you don't want there wow. and, and and planting new life. Yeah. And so um, that was really inspiring to me. Sure. Yeah. And when you're stripped of everything, and I read, I, I listened to this radio interview about incarcerated women and coming back into the community, and one woman was saying how she lost her soul. And that's just so, just crazy. to You know, we just take for granted that people go through things, but they don't realize how much you're stripped of things when you're, incarcerated or, or you're on the streets or anywhere mm -hmm. and how you rebuild that and so nature like you said is a beautiful magical way to reintroduce yeah. that connection yeah. yeah yeah so that's a great way what are some other ways so that you have the nature you have what about like um i know educational programs sound so you know been there done that but you need it, right? When you come back out into the real world, you need some kind of a transition. You need a community to build and support you so that you don't go back into your old life. Yeah, so um, one of our uh, projects, or, or it's the YWCA's project, but we, we oh, yeah. helped with that too, is um, a transitional uh, housing living. And right. um, they provide opportunities for enrichment there and I was able to visit and see their garden that they're working on. See, again, and, back, yeah, back to nature. Back to nature, right? you're absolutely right. And um, I happen to come with my dog who um, <laughs> is a lovely, friendly um, dog and they love the, you know, the therapeutic nature of the interaction yes. with my golden Animals retriever. Animals and nature, yeah, right. What right. a great thing. We're going to hold right. that thought because I think we're touching on to some things. You know, the powerful um, essence of nature and influence on how people can get back on your feet is something that really is something that maybe we should focus more on. Um, we're going to take a quick break and we'll come back and continue talking about um, people who need help and how to get back on their feet and how the Women's Fund supports that. Don't go away. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland every Friday at 3 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about things of interest to those of us who live here and my Past blogs can be found at cowielucas.com. Okay, I didn't listen. 
Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff, MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. Back to Quack Talk, talking to Leela from the Women's Fund about incarcerated women and how to get back on their feet, coming back here to the Hawaiian community, and the support or lack thereof. You know, there's always a lack thereof, unfortunately. But we try to do as much as we can. We talked about nature being the healing thing. Uh, now, getting back into the real world, unfortunately, it seems that the path, if not supported properly, uh, properly is that you end up in the streets. Is that true, Leela? I think that's true. What uh, we've seen in the past, or what I've heard anyway from some of our uh, partners who work with the homeless, is that often people emerge from prison and they don't have anywhere to go. Right. Um, and previously, the Nimitz Viaduct was a location. Um, the city, several months ago, moved uh, the, the, the neighborhood Oh, let's okay. say because it is a, it, it is a community <laughs> so low, right it is a community so yes that that's that's one option right for I mean not to put the blame on anyone but who where these these women when they come out they've got nothing to, they have to rebuild everything whose mm -hmm. job is it to help support them and transition them properly shouldn't the government be having some more facilities or having more specific transitional um, provisions for them well you know I think it depends on who you ask <laughs> um, and I'm not sure if I want to wade into right, those waters, right. but um, we, we, we do support programs that help w women who emerge from the system. So right. that's, so that's where you we stand. If you yeah. weren't here, that's what I'm saying, yeah. is who would be helping them? You know, the government won't do anything because they say, oh, okay, you got yourself in trouble, you're in, now you're out, you get back into your life yourself. They don't care. Yeah, well, um, there's a there's a wonderful little organization that's called Project Date, and okay. Date stands for Discern, Assist. Oh darn, I can't remember the T, <laughs> but the last one is Empower. Okay. Anyway, I'll have to figure Date. out what the what the T was. And they uh, have a program called Holo Holo E Holo Holo Kupuna Vahine. Okay. And we gave them a grant. It wasn't quite for five thousand dollars. They asked for a bit less. Um, oh. And they uh, wanted the money to purchase bus passes for the women. As Specifically homeless women. Homeless women. And this is the project date was working with, and I say was, not because they don't exist anymore, but because the location of the, the community has moved. Okay. From, but at the time, uh, last year, the, uh, the community was in, in that neighborhood of the Nimitz Viaduct underneath. Right. And the bus passes were supposed to provide a way out of homelessness. And there was a, a hmm. these women love the bus pass. I know, it's a little <laughs> bit of a head scratcher when you first hear it, but listen to this story. So okay. I'm, I'll call her Leilani, okay. um, not her real name. Yeah. So she ended up homeless as a result of a bad relationship that had gotten worse. And okay. she had been living there uh, under the viaduct for about 18 years. 18 and, years? Yeah. Like oh I said, God. I called it a neighborhood, right? There's a reason. I mean, there, you know, you have your space, you have your neighbors, right. um, support system. Just can't imagine being homeless for 18 years, but okay. Yeah, yeah. it's right. not not an easy yeah. road to hoe. But um, so Leilani was the recipient of one of our bus passes. Okay. And she used her bus pass to get to the doctor because if you, right, right. You're, if you're homeless, you don't necessarily have a car or a license oh, or sure. ID. Right. So she went to the doctor. Yeah. The doctor certified her disability. That allowed her to get a permanent bus pass because when you when you're disabled, ah. you can get a permanent bus pass. Right. She used that to meet with her social worker because the social workers do not travel to where the homeless person lives. The homeless person has to go to the social worker. Right, and then with right. the help of the social worker, Leilani was able to get her ID card and qualify for disability payments and also qualify for Section 8 housing and move into wow. an apartment. That's and amazing. all that yeah. from a bus pass. 
That's wonderful. Isn't so that great? There, there you proved me wrong because in my opening I thought, where, you know, these grants, how far can it reach a person? But there you go. Yeah, that's it's a lot less than five thousand dollars. One bus pass. Yeah. And by the time I got down to the viaduct, because I do try to do site visits and mm -hmm. to to you know to see what the grantees are doing exactly. I mean, I know what they're doing, but how are they doing it? I'm right. interested. Um, and it's part of my due diligence, frankly. Okay. But, um, you know, by the time I got down there, the bus passes had already been all given out. They had used um, the, the monies already. And I was there on a day when Project 8 was distributing food, okay. which is given by the food bank. Uh, we gave away, in a half an hour, 90 bags of food. That's a lot. Half an hour. Yeah, half an hour. And women were coming up and asking, you know, do you have any more bus passes? Oh. Yeah, so it was a it was a popular program yeah. that did a lot of good. That's a brilliant concept. Maybe yeah. people wouldn't think about that. And what about um, homeless women who are who are mothers and and do they have children that they need to support and and their lifestyle and their well being? They, they they do. There are there are families um, who are living, um, not outside of homes under under right. viaducts. And the difference that I saw there was that. Um, it, a family would get fresh food. So where most people who came got a bag of, let's say it would be cereal or something in a can, I all preserved uh, food. Um, the family might get some eggs and also um, possibly some meat. Right. You know, we really take things for granted in our lives, yeah? Mm -hmm. Just the yeah. simple things. It's just, just fresh produce. And so um, organizations like yours make this possible for just these individuals who are so unfortunate in their situation. Are there some um, visions that you have on behalf of the organization that you want to um, impact in Hawaii? Because there are so many areas, but are there any specific areas that you think need more support and maybe the support and awareness of the public? Well, I'm really glad you brought that up because as we speak, yeah. uh, Women's Fund has just uh, well, not just begun. We're, we're, we're well down the process of commissioning research on the status of women in Hawaii. And we're looking specifically at uh, poverty and opportunity and employment. And what we're trying to do is to really figure out where, where are we behind? What is standing in the way of the success of women and girls mm -hmm. in Hawaii? And not just Oahu, the whole state. Of course. Um, and what those data will allow us to do is to be more strategic about our grant making. So we will continue, I hope, mm. with the support of the community, the generosity of our, our wonderful donors, both old and new, mm. uh, to, to support those programs that we deem valuable and necessary. But we will also set aside a certain amount of our annual grant making budget to say, Let's just say, for example, our study shows up, or our study reveals that women aren't getting good jobs because they don't have sufficient job training. So we'll specifically invite nonprofits to submit applications to provide job training. Okay. And in that way, we hope to create great impact and improve the situation for as many women as possible. So you're kind of like the umbrella that, that threads out to so many different nonprofits. And these individual nonprofits, again, thread out to the people. And they try to right. bring in the resources. Right. So we don't provide the direct service. Yeah. Um, but what we do, in addition to making grants to the organizations that provide direct service, is we bring visibility to women and girls' issues and visibility to women and girls philanthropy. Why invest in women and girls? Mm. Um, which we touched upon a little bit at the beginning about yeah. how women reinvest in their communities. Right. Yeah. We always talk about education and the importance of it and how that can keep you on track. But do you think that's something that's um, too far to reach for maybe underprivileged girls here? Or do you think that's something that should be a given and there are other issues that we need to really kind of focus on to support them? I think it should be a given. It should, right? I think so, yeah. And I think that um, when parents, yeah. um, the children research has shown will strive for at least the academic or educational achievement of their parents. So yes. when the parents have the education, they will instill that value in the kids. Right. But uh, if they don't, that's the problem. Yeah, if, if they the, don't, I mean, it's not, they, you do have those individuals who will be motivated and, and, and who, will, 
who will succeed no matter what. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but by we, and large, we're that's focusing what we see. on the ones who need that support, yeah. right? So you have a regular fundraiser every year to kind of support all the different areas that you do do. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to tell us a little bit about that or how people can support the Women's Fund and yeah. where it goes to? I would love to talk about that okay. because it, our fundraiser is so much fun. Um, we're sold out already. We've been sold oh, out great. for, for uh, three weeks prior to the fundraiser, which is on May 15th. But it's our yep. tea and champagne. This year is our 12th annual. Uh -huh. And um, it's a celebration of the, the grantees from last year. So in this case, our, of our 2016 grantees. And this event is really the, um, our method for, um, I mean, frankly, getting money for our grants right, for sure. 2017 um, and, and forward. And we have this really fun activity that we do. It's called a dessert dash. And each table of 10 will donate each individual. Let's say you put in 50 and I put in, I don't know, 25 and so on and so forth. And whichever table has the highest bid on down gets to have first crack at selecting their dessert. And these desserts are donated by chefs from a ton of great restaurants mm -hmm. all over. Mm -hmm. um, Honolulu mostly. Yeah. Um, so yeah. It's, it's fun. It is fun. Yeah. But, and they, but we want to remind people that in the fun behind it is that whole purpose from the heart to support all these women mm -hmm. who do. You know, I, it just reminds me quickly of a, an interview I did of this refugee back in Hong Kong who was from Africa. And she had walked by um, a bakery and she saw a cake that she was salivating over basically. She hadn't had a cake for so long. that But she didn't have the resource and the means to buy a piece of cake and it just tore my heart apart. I mean, I just like like bawling at the interview. Because we just really take for granted that um, we have things and we can support other people and it's all good on paper, like we're supporting these great um, issues. But to really feel for them, I think, I don't know how mm -hmm. we can really remind people to be more compassionate. Yeah. How do, how do, what are some... We, well, we do a little bit of tea and champagne. We always have a grantee speaker come and um, to tell about how um, they benefited from the work of um, the nonprofit yeah. and also indirectly from Women's Fund. Um, so, are there is there you have a website if people can look for more information on how they want to support you and where absolutely. it goes? Absolutely, yeah. Our website is womensfundhawaii.org, mm -hmm. and of course, we have a donate button. We have a uh, well, this is your program, right? That's not the program. I mean, for this is our event, but that's our brochure for our organization. Right. Okay. Yeah. So this is the Women's Fund of Hawaii, and it has information. The website has all the information on the types of areas that you cover. I it mean, does, and we are going through. Um, we're rehabilitating our website actually okay. here shortly. So um, look for a new fabulous, great okay. Women's Fund of Hawaii website. Well, that's what you're doing though. Soon. You're yeah. rehabilitating yes, women of everything, Hawaii. Everything. So, everything. Thank yeah. you for yeah. that. Thank you so much for supporting because you know women need all the help here and we really appreciate that. So thank you for sharing all the information with us and good luck with your teen champagne. Sounds oh, thank, so fun. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you for tuning in. Mm -hmm. We'll talk to you next time. Bye.